All right, good morning, church. It's good to see you all this morning. We're going to go ahead and get started here. We're going to open with a word of prayer before we lift our voices before him. Lord, we come before you, our King, the King of kings and Lord of lords. You are the master of everything, Lord. You created us. And Lord, though, and Lord, though we spoiled your creation through sin, you redeemed us by your shed blood, and we praise and worship and magnify you. God, you are so worthy. You're worthy of more praise than we could ever give. Lord, they used to say, if I had 10,000 tongues, I could not praise you enough. And it's so true, Lord. God, we just rejoice that one day we will worship you forever and ever in heaven. With the angels and saints of old, we will glorify and magnify the name of the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world for our sins. But Lord, here we are today. We're gathered in your presence here in this place, Lord, to lift up your name, to magnify you. And we just ask you now, Lord, to just fill this place with the power of your presence. Fill us afresh, Lord, a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon each and every heart, Lord, who is in this room and those who are watching online. Lord, meet them where they are, God, and bring us all to the place where you want us to be. Anoint your word today. Anoint Pastor Tim. Fill him afresh, Lord, that the word that goes forth may pierce our hearts and bring transformation to our lives, that we may please you in all that we do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Why don't you stand with us?
That again, open the eyes of my heart. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. 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 see you for you are high and lifted up
Amen and amen. Lord, we look forward to the day when we would sing that song in your presence. But for now, Lord, we want to praise you and give you great thanks and honor and glory and majesty for all that you've done for us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Welcome to CCR. Why don't you all briefly greet one another, please? Good morning. That's where it was. I was looking for that thing. <laughs> How's everybody doing today? Happy 4th of July weekend to all of you. Dr. Russ, thank you for opening up your property. We're glad to uh, get out there and uh, fellowship and uh, eat more calories than we need, but uh, kind of get a head start on the 4th, but good to see all of you. Those of you that are uh, joining online, welcome uh, Good morning to you as well. Uh, good to have each and every one of you. Those are your visitors. Uh, good to have you here also. I know we've got people that are on vacation, and I know we've got people that are out of town uh, this weekend, but we also have uh, around the United States another wave of COVID going through, and we have a number of families uh, that have had uh, We have friends in North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, uh, Fredericksburg, Williamsburg, uh, that have COVID, but uh, thankfully, everybody that I have been talking to, emailing, texting, uh, says it's milder um, uh, than other waves, so that's a blessing, uh, but, uh, but it is going around, so uh, if you're at home watching us online, we're glad to have you joining us. Uh, drink lots and lots of fluids, lots of fluids, keep drinking fluids, and pray, and uh, that's the main thing that God uh, will keep us. Um, uh, he's the one that sustains us. Uh, it's been the gift that keeps giving, though. Uh, every time we think it's done, there's another wave of it, but uh, I think people are getting more immune to it. But on the other hand, you never can tell. It's different with every person. So uh, be praying for those that are sick, and not only here, but in other churches and outside the church. And uh, But... Um, if you're well, I hope you have a great uh, fourth. I'm glad to be an American. I'm glad that God, uh, I'm glad I was born in this country. I'm glad for the freedoms that we have, but I'm under no illusions that uh, just because we have these freedoms doesn't mean that we're using them for the Lord as a country. So we'll be praying in just a few minutes for revival. We, we still desperately need it. Uh, I'm thankful that, you know, we can still preach the gospel uh, and send missionaries and do all these things. But uh, I also... Uh, pray for our nation that uh, we would find not freedom in a flag, but freedom in Jesus. Amen. And that's what we desperately, desperately need. I want to uh, just uh, draw a couple of things to your attention. Uh, we will have in the next couple of weeks, brand new, uh, we're getting rid of the old look. And matter of fact, we had run out of the old look and uh, they had just too much stuff on them. Uh, totally different design now. Uh, we'll actually have two information and invite cards. We don't call them business cards. This is not a business. Uh, information and invite cards, you know, the, the side of it, size of business cards. But uh, on the left hand will be kind of the wood grain one that has a little bit more information. If you're handing it to someone who wants kind of as much information as they can get, that one has uh, a slim down from what we had before. But uh, that will be the front of it. And then the back of it will be the one with the QR codes. And then we'll have another uh, version the front will be the QR codes, that little bit of information. Like a younger person, they're like, I just want to know. I can scan my phone. That's all I need to know. I don't need all that other stuff. And so that'll be the front of some. And then the back uh, will be that one that has a little um, wood grain bar across the top. So there'll be two versions. We'll have them out in the information booth. And we're looking forward to seeing how God can use them to just invite people. Hey, you're talking to someone. Say, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I'll watch online. If you give me a shot, say you can do that. You can invite them here. Bring them here. And uh, we'll have those in the next couple of weeks. Uh, by the way, you probably didn't even notice, but uh, uh, the, wood, the wood trim up here on the uh, stage, it used to be a honey wood. Uh, Javon and Bradley this week sanded it. Our interns, they sanded it and stained it. So now it is a, a shade of um, uh, espresso now, and it matches the, the, the stage and the, and the pulpit and things like that. So little by little, we're making little progress. In the first service, only one person noticed that we had even done that. So um, we'll see what happens if we kind of change things around. I'm not going to say anymore. We'll just do things and see if you even notice. A year later, we changed that a year ago. You didn't even notice that. But we're making progress, and we're thankful for that. This coming Wednesday, uh, you know, we're right at the midpoint 
of 2022. We have passed the first six months. We have six months left in the year. Uh, we're actually on day, day three into the next six months. Uh, but, you know, as I mentioned in the first service, we, uh, you know, we appreciate firing up the grill and we appreciate fireworks. But we need fasting more than we need fireworks. We need fasting and prayer more than we need fired up grills. I, I like those things. I'll do those things. But uh, I, would much, I would probably give those up if all the church would say, hey, let's all just gather and fast and pray. And we're going to be doing that uh, this Wednesday night. Uh, if you're able to fast that day, part of the day, the whole day, maybe you, uh, maybe you have a medical condition, you can't fast the whole day, that's fine. Fast something, fast from something, if, even if you couldn't fast food. But those of you that can, if you're able to fast food, fast uh, partial or the entire day, and we'll gather and pray that night for our nation for one another, for this church, for the body of Christ, for the believers around the world, uh, lost to come to Christ. The, Lord, we, the Lord's doing a good work of us planting seeds here in the summer. Summer is planting season. I know it's a little different with people on vacation and all these other things, but nevertheless, we've been planting a lot, and we are looking forward to God doing a harvest in the fall. So I pray that uh, you'll come out and join us this Wednesday night. Those of you that are visiting with us, uh, something we started uh, when the pandemic was a totally foreign, unknown thing, right when we had the kind of national lockdowns, we started getting on our knees and <clears throat> praying for God's intervention and God's help and the work of revival. And we've not stopped. As I told the church months ago, I, I felt led, all right, Lord, uh, you know, I'll continue to do this. But then I was like, what, do I continue to do this? And God made it really clear to me to keep doing it. So we've been getting on our knees every single Sunday for about 45 seconds of silence, and then I close in prayer. So if you're visiting with us, uh, if you're not comfortable with that, or you have bad knees, or recent knee surgery, or your doctor said don't do that, that's fine. Just stay seated. But uh, those of you that are able to get on your knees, uh, we are going to go ahead and get on our knees for about 45 seconds of silence and humbling ourselves before the Lord and asking Him to bring the revival which our nation desperately needs. The church needs it. We have a very lukewarm church in this country. And we just uh, want God to stir us. And so if you're able to get on your knees, please do so. Let's pray. Father, we once again humble ourselves. Lord, you are a holy and mighty and worthy and righteous God and Father. We bow before you, Lord. We're only here by your grace. We're only here by your mercy, your mercies that are new every day. And for those of us that know you as Lord and Savior, thank you for redeeming us. Thank you for calling us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Lord, we pray that even in this room, we would surrender all that we are to you. We ask that you cleanse us and forgive us, Lord, of our own apathy, of our own pride, of our own idolatries, our own things that get in the way of loving you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We intercede for the body of Christ, Lord. We pray that you do a purifying work in the church. Much of the church has begun to drift towards the world, so we pray, Lord, that you would call back your bride clean and refresh and restore the joy of our salvation, Lord, all of us, Lord, and Lord, that we would delight in serving you. Lord, that we'd be a clean and ready bride for you could come back at any moment. We pray that you'd open the eyes of those that are in darkness from uh, the halls of Washington to Main Street to Wall Street to Hollywood to small towns and farms to people with uh, great fame and celebrity status to people with no name, Lord. We pray that you would call our nation, which is so filled with itself, 
so lifted up with pride, uh, as was Babylon, as was Sodom and Gomorrah, as was Egypt, as was Rome. Lord, so is America today. Lord, we have so much freedom and we've used it instead of to worship you, but Lord, instead to rebel against you. And so Lord, we pray that you turn people away from sexual immorality and idolatry and, and all the pride and all the arrogance. And Lord, we see still so many vestiges of racism and so many things in this nation, Lord, uh, you would heal if there would only be repentance. And Lord, we pray that you would just turn hearts back to you. We pray that the gospel would go forth in a mighty way from the pulpits of America. And Lord, we pray for a return to teaching the whole counsel of God and that none, no verse would be off limits, that everything would be presented. And Lord, we trust you for the results. We ask, Lord, this morning we're praying for the nation of Israel as we've been praying, Lord, for one nation a week. We pray for that small little country, Lord, that was chosen by you to bring forth the Messiah and Jesus, who are someday you will return. I pray for the nation of Israel. I pray for Dr. Sam and Miriam that uh, visit and serve so often there in the church plants, not only uh, in, um, in the Jewish communities, but also in the Muslim and Arab and Palestinian communities and the Gaza Strip and the East Bank. And Lord, all throughout Israel, we thank you for the souls that are coming to faith in Yeshua, Messiah, their Lord and Savior. Lord, we pray that it's just the beginning of a great harvest in Israel. Lord, we, uh, we love uh, what you are doing uh, in that place. And Lord, we know that uh, there's much more to be done. So we just lift them up to you. We pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world that you would deliver them, strengthen them, and Lord, your hand would be upon them. And Lord, use them in a great way in such dark and difficult places. We thank you, Jesus, that we can bring all things to you in prayer as we'll see even this morning in John chapter 14. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. And as you find your seats, uh, grab your Bibles and turn them to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. If you're visiting and you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. We're glad to put one in your hand. We're going through the book of John. We're in this upper room discourse here in the 14th chapter. Working our way through, we'll pick it up with where we left off. We're starting in verse 12, John chapter 14, starting in verse 12. <clears throat> Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these will he do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Let's pray again. Father, I ask, Lord, that your spirit, the spirit that we're reading about in this text, would just fall afresh upon this place. Fall afresh upon me. I need your strength. I need your wisdom. I need your peace, your power, uh, Lord, your joy. Uh, Lord, I need your insights. Uh, we need all of us, Lord, to have soft hearts, open ears, and Lord, a willingness to draw nearer to you. Lord, I pray that you'd speak to each and every person, myself included, those online, those out in the courtyard, in the fellowship hall, here in the sanctuary. Lord, draw us nearer to Jesus and conform us to your image here this morning. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. If you were here with us last week, you'll recall that the scene and the setting has not changed. It is Jesus and the eleven. The 12 minus Judas, they are still in the upper room. The disciples are still troubled. They are still perplexed about Jesus leaving. And while Jesus continues his discourse, his teaching, and his encouragement, the scene hasn't changed, but Jesus has spoken a succession of new revelations intended for the disciples' immediate comfort and for their courage 
which they're going to need even more in the hours to come, but also for their future role as apostles. Um, they will be given the responsibility of teaching these doctrines that Jesus has given them. Jesus has just told them about his father's house, which we understand to be where? Heaven. And there's many mansions there. And after he leaves, he will be personally preparing a place for each of them and later bringing them to himself. The disciples, with Philip as a spokesperson, have asked Jesus to show them the Father. Just show us the Father. That seeing the Father would be sufficient to give them the courage and the perseverance they may be lacking. Remember that Moses and Isaiah, they had both seen a glimpse of the glory of God. And perhaps that, that's what the disciples are hoping for, just a glimpse of God's glory to strengthen them, hoping to see and experience what Moses and Isaiah had seen. And Jesus informs the disciples that the fact is, if they've seen him, they've seen the Father. Not like that, but he and the Father are one. But Jesus, he is the full representation of God the Father in human flesh. And he's both the Son and the everlasting Father, as we saw in Isaiah 9, 6. We hear that verse often around the Christmas season. And as Jesus continues in his methodical preparation of these 11 men, and now all of us that are reading this, having already given them several powerful proclamations of himself and some new perspectives and some new revelations and some new encouraging promises to hold on to and to look forward to, he adds to all of that a few more very precious promises for them and all of us who believe in Jesus, which we've just read a few minutes ago. If you're taking notes, you See the title this morning, The Promise of Prayer and of the Helper. There are actually four promises in the text that we just read. Two of them are both related to the intercessory work of Jesus on behalf of believers, that he is our go-between between us and God the Father. The third is the glorious promise of the Holy Spirit himself, the coming or giving of the Spirit to the believer. And the fourth is simultaneously related to the Spirit and Jesus' previous promise to what? To come and take them, all of us, to the Father's house. I told you I'm glad that I was born in America. I don't know why God had me born in Annapolis, Maryland, 1969 into this country. I could have been born anywhere in the world. I appreciate the freedoms, but this country is not my home. How about you? Matter of fact, I feel more, I was, listen, I was uh, listening to a message from another pastor and talking about being aliens and strangers in this world. And the longer I live here, I feel like a stranger in my own country because this isn't our home. Jesus said, this is not where we're going to spend eternity. Your house will be with my house. And he's promised them that till they get there, we'll have the Holy Spirit to help us weather anything and everything. And so we'll look at these things this morning. Turn your attention back to verse 12. He says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. Most assuredly it starts out, some of your Bible versions may say, verily, verily. Some of your translations may say, Truly, truly. But mine starts out, most assuredly, I'm in the New King James, which is the most holy version. I'm just kidding. Um, just, just a joke. The New King James. I didn't even say the King James. I didn't even know these and thous this morning, but um, nevertheless, uh, it could just as easily read assuredly, assuredly. It's the same 
Greek word, in other words, I'm saying that uh, these words, each of them in the Greek is the word amen or amen, depending on how you say it. And we've talked about this before. Amen is essentially the same word with the same meaning in virtually every language on planet Earth. It's always agreed to as meaning true and faithful. That's why people, if they agree with you, they say, amen, that's true, I agree. That's a faithful statement. doesn't matter the language around the world, it always means true and faithful. But amen at the beginning of a statement or discourse in Scripture, it means surely or truly. And amen at the end of a statement in Scripture or a prayer, it means so be it, may it be fulfilled. The beauty of Jesus saying, amen, amen, verily, verily, truly, truly, is that whatever Jesus says, and if he says an amen, it's always truly, and it's also always, so be it. In 1 Corinthians 1.20, we see this passage, for all the promises of God in him are yes and Amen. That's powerful enough that all the promises of God are surely, truly, let it be settled, faithful. But then we see in Revelation 3, 14, something even more magnificent. These things says the amen. You might want to be careful how you use the word amen when you find out it's one of Jesus' names. These things says the amen, the faithful and true witness the beginning of the creation of God. So we understand that Jesus is the amen. Not only does he say, verily, verily, amen, amen. He is the amen. Just as Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, which we read about in this same 14th chapter, he's also the amen. The perpetual truly, the so be it, and all that he says and all that he is. We can all make promises. If I asked you to raise your hand, how many of you made a promise this year and didn't keep it? All of us would have to say something. Me and my wife, we start to just blame our forgetful brains. That, you know, that we now have an out for not keeping promise. I just forgot, you know. I forgot it was Tuesday, much less that I was supposed to pick that up. But you and I, we can make promises. Only Jesus, who is God in human flesh, can keep every promise that he ever makes. Never, not a single failed promise. And only Jesus would know to make these promises. Only he would say, I'm going to send a helper. Only he would say, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. Only he would know to make these promises. Why? Because they're coming directly from the throne of God through the Son. And they're only coming, these promises are only coming to the disciples that have trusted in the Son for salvation. Remember, by way of reminder, and those of you that are visiting here today, remember this upper room discourse. Jesus gathered with the eleven. Judas has left the room. By design, there could be no one left in the room except for believers in Jesus, those who are truly saved. They had faith in Christ. This is a believers-only meeting there in the upper room. It's the Savior and the saved. It's the shepherd and his sheep. It's the rabbi and his students. It's the father with his sons. Now, Jesus had just mentioned the works that he did, and the miracles back in verse 11 from last week. I don't have to come time to read it. So, but there's no break in the discussion. We've talked about this is one continuous setting. We're just having to kind of take it in pieces and parts to get us week to week. But he says to those that believe in him that they're going to do the same works he did. What was the essence of all the works that Jesus did? I know that they were mighty, uh, how many of you have ever healed anyone from leprosy? Anyone raised anyone from the dead? Anyone walked on water lately? You say, hold on, I don't think I've done any of these things, and I'm pretty sure I'm saved. 
What was the essence of all the works Jesus did? Here's the essence of all the works that he did. Because some of them weren't miraculous. Some of them were just compassionate or a word or a loving look at someone. But they were still the works of God. So the essence of all the works that Jesus did were that they were always and all of them the will of the Father. That's what it was. Boy, I've heard some goofy teachings on this stuff. Have you? Telling people they're going to go out and do all kinds of stuff. This is not what Jesus is saying here. The followers of Jesus will likewise, hear this clearly, the followers of Jesus will likewise do the will of God. That's the, that's the essence of the works of Jesus, that they were the will of God. The fact that his are powerful and ours aren't is not relevant. The question, are they the works of God? Are they the will of God? Not necessarily the miraculous, but done and surrendered obedience to God's will. And in the context, you'll see in verse 15, this obedience is important. We have to be obedient to the Lord because Jesus was obedient to the Father. This bears out the text. We'll see this in just a couple of minutes. But let's also understand that even though the vast majority of believers will never do the miraculous, miraculous works of Jesus, we can all do the will of God in Jesus, but the miraculous works still were done by some. For example, the apostles, who will be foundational to Jesus building his church, they very soon after all this will do some mighty works. They will actually heal sick people. They will actually do some of the very things that Jesus did. We call that the apostolic age at that point. Let's also understand that the primary meaning here is that the ordained works of the Father, just as Jesus had done the ordained works of the Father, we will now the disciples first, and then following them, the succession of the church over the last 2,000 years, we will then be doing the same will of the Father, led by the Father. You and I, it tells us in the Scriptures in the New Testament that we ordained, uh, and that there was works already set for us to do. There are things that God wants me to fulfill. They may not be the, ma the majestic miracles of Jesus, but they will be the will of God in my life and in your life. Now, there is also a possible future fulfillment in Jesus saying this as well. Remember, the apostles did do some mighty miracles. Uh, it is possible that when we come back in the millennium reign of Christ, did you know that when we come back for the thousand-year reign, which will make your lifetime here seem short, does anyone plan on living a thousand years? I mean, at most... I just saw we have a Calvary Chapel pastor out in California. His mom turned 106 or 107 recently. That's pretty amazing. And she looks like in great health. Uh, but that's, that's the rarity. Most people don't live to be 106, 107. But in the millennium reign of Christ, we're going to come back from heaven with glorified body. It is possible that the unsaved world and those that we... God may have us heal some people. There may be... Think we'll, have, we'll have abilities that we don't have today. So there may be a future fulfillment, but we don't know that. I'm not here to teach that as a doctrine. I'm just simply saying that there are things in the millennium that could come into play that we don't even see uh, at this point. But Jesus promises that in addition to the works that he did, he also said we will do greater works. Now this is even more confusing. How could we do anything greater than raising Lazarus? What does he mean by this? And why? He says, you'll do greater works because I'm going to the Father. Because he was going to the Father. And when he goes to the Father, when Jesus ascends back to the Father, it begins a new work, which we call the church age, or the age of grace, a new work that's granted by the Father, given from the Son, and done in and through us, the church, or the bride. The greater, though, is not greater and miraculous power. We always think, um, one of the problems of human beings, and we say, man, uh, that is an amazing church. When you hear, oh, it must be 10,000 people. No. 
Jesus wrote a letter to seven churches. One of them, he gave great commendation, and they were a small church with very little strength, and they were at the Church of Philadelphia. But a couple of big, shiny objects, he said, you're dead as a corpse, and you're totally lukewarm. We think of greatness as numeric and big and all this other kind of stuff, but that's not always the... And I'm not saying that that can't be the case. God, and Charles Spurgeon Church and Tabernacle there in London was huge, and there, the prayer ministry was amazing, and God really was pouring out His Spirit. But great is not always big. It's not always all of those things. Why did Jesus say the works would be greater? Nothing that the entire church and the saints have done in the last 2,000 years is greater than anything Jesus has done. Nothing we've done is greater as far as more miraculous, as far as more amazing. But the greater is in scope. And in spite of us. Let me see if I can explain what I mean by that. Jesus lived his entire 30-year life in and around, now you wouldn't go down to Egypt as a child, but even that, the circumference was in and around Israel. This small little area on a map about the size of New Jersey. His entire ministry was there in that small area that we know as Israel. Since the ascension of Jesus going back to heaven, an exponential far greater number of people have come to know about him, his ministry, everything he taught, the power of the gospel, and have come to know him as Savior over the last 20 centuries. It's also a great and mighty thing that God would use flawed vessels like us to do what he's done over the last 2,000 years. We understand, we understand Jesus was perfect. Amen? We understand he was mighty. We understand he was flawless. We understand he could do miracles. We can't do any of those things. And Jesus says, and I go back to my father, I'm going to leave this in your hands, and you're going to do, it's going to be greater because in spite of how incompetent you all are, and no ability, and you're just dust and ashes, I'm going to do all this. I'm going to breathe it through the church. And the greater is in scope, and the number of people that have been touched, and the many, many souls that have been saved, not that we did greater miracles. But it is greater, and it fans out, and it's now reverberating over these last 2,000 years. But all this would happen because Jesus would return to the Father and he would initiate this age of grace and the gospel, which we're now in and still in until Jesus comes to rapture the church. And all this is carried forth by Jesus' spiritual offspring, which starts with the apostles and the other disciples that were saved at that time and carries forward all the way to us. Look at verse 13 as we move forward. And whatever you ask in my name... That I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now, Jesus had already taught the disciples that when they are to pray, they are to pray, you know this passage, our Father, hallowed be the name, our Father. He had already taught them to pray that they're praying to the Father, that their prayers were going to the Father, but he's letting them know, he's reminding them that as he said in this same upper room discourse, he is the way. Not only the way to salvation, but the way to the Father in our prayer life. He's the door. He's the access to the Father. He's the access to the throne room of grace. And using his name does not work for anyone or just anyone's prayers. Despite, you know, a lot of people uh, you'll see on social media, you're in my prayers. But I thought you were an atheist. You know, that kind of thing, right? Everybody says it. It's just a phrase of speech now. But to use the name, he says, you will, and whatever you ask in my name, there in verse 13, 
to use his name is reserved for his children, his sheep. The world is free to use the name of Jesus in any way they want, and they like to sometimes use it as a swear word, at, to their own peril. God will give them the option to abuse the name if they choose to, but everyone will answer for that someday. Amen? Those of us who know him, we don't want to misuse his name. Those that know him, we know the power of his name. We know the purifying work of his name. His name both releases and also restricts. It sets people free, but it also will bind. We know that we can come to Jesus with everything, but not just anything. What do you mean by that? What do you mean we can come to him with everything, but not just anything? In other words, to use his name is to invoke his character. So we, and we wouldn't want to pray a prayer like this. Lord, give me all the stuff I want. Give me anything I want. That's not the character of Christ, is it? No. But if we prayed, Lord, make me humble and willing to serve, that is the character of Jesus. Make me humble, willing to serve, willing to be poured out. D.L. Moody said this, he said, in true prayer, there will be submission. It's submitting our desires, it's submitting our self, it's submitting our spirit and say, Lord, when you really are praying to God, you're not barking out orders or handing a wish list, but you're submitting yourself to the authority of God, to the holiness of God. That's why we got on our knees earlier. We're submitting to the Lord. It's not self-seeking. It's the honor of God that we're seeking. William Barclay said this. I love this quote as well. The test of any prayer is, can I make it in the name of Jesus? No man, for instance, could pray for personal revenge, for personal ambition, for some unworthy and unchristian object in the name of Jesus. I have seen this misuse. This week I was watching a clip of a very large church in another state, and the pastor was using the name of Jesus and pontificating about all the virtues of abortion. I don't know what Bible he found. I don't know where he got the idea that God who gives every single, the difference between, it's not even just biology, every person is a soul. God breathes life into a soul. And then to abuse and use the name of Jesus to actually make yourself rich to people that want to have their ears tickled is anathema to God. But we are not, we're not called to use his name in an unchristian way, in an ungodly way. Even our prayers are to glorify God the Father. Jesus said uh, that you'll ask in my name that the Father may be glorified. And those things that we pray according to his will and to the honor of his name, he will do those things. But I have a, a warning on this one. He will do them, but not always the way that we expect. Not always in the timing, get a big, big amen on that one, right? Not always in the timing we expect, not always in the means we expect. You pray for patience, he will send someone to your life that will grate your every nerve. <laughs> Lord, make me a patient person. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> and they're probably a mirror of ourselves, right? That's the worst part about it. We start to see it. Man, they're so annoying. And you look, I think I do that. You know, that kind of thing. In Psalm 6, 9, we can know that Jesus is hearing us. It says in Psalm 6, 9, the Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. He's telling us here, he says, I want you to ask in my name and I'm going to hear it. He's faithful to hear our prayers. He's faithful even if we come 
a little bit amiss, but our heart's in the right place. Because we sometimes get things wrong just with our humanity. It's not always like that we have a bad motive. Sometimes we just have a skewed perspective because we, we, we don't see all the facts the way God sees them. And let's face it, sometimes we come and our prayers are very weak because we're not praying with much faith and we don't even feel like we have much in the way of faith. It feels very weak. The disciples could relate. They're, still, they're in the presence of Jesus and they're still troubled and perplexed right here. But I love this passage as well. 2 Timothy 2.13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. You know, those times where we're like, Lord, I had no faith whatsoever. He's like, but I did. But I kept you from going, you know, way off the rails. Instead, you just had a bad day. I kept you just skimming your knees instead of actually breaking both legs. I'm talking about a spiritual metaphor, if you will. But he wants us to ignore how we feel. Your feelings are not... Your feelings are not a great indicator of anything. The Word of God overrides our feelings. And Jesus is telling us, I want you to ignore how you feel and ask me and seek me with all of our hearts. Look at verse 14. And if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Here, Jesus repeats the second time in a row. He says, ask me in my name and I will do it. Twice in a row. It's another verily, verily, if you will. Uh, He's emphasizing here, the added emphasis is that we, the family of God, we've been brought into a what? Relationship. And he's saying, I want you to ask me. I'm imploring you to ask me. We've been brought into a relation, one of communion and communication, because communion and communication go hand in hand. If we are in unity with God, we will be talking with the Lord, and He will be talking to us. We are all, all, all of us called to a prayer life. Every, if you're born again, you're called to a prayer life. Say, well, other people do all the praying. I do, um, you know, I do the singing. Or I do uh, the talking. Or I do the teaching. No, everyone is called to a prayer life, to be in communion with God and a communication with the Lord to the Father through Jesus the Son. And Jesus is exhorting the disciples to walk in fellowship. And the asking, say you're asking the Lord for things that are according to the will of God. The asking is now natural through the fact that our adoption was supernatural. So we, in other words, we get a new nature with salvation. So our nature now wants to talk to God. Remember, men love darkness rather than light. They run from God and run away from God. And that's why you see our country, they are fine with anything until you talk about, start talking about what God says and what Jesus says. And then they, they don't want to hear it. Why? Because mankind resists that relationship with God. But once you've been adopted through a supernatural work of uh, salvation, then it becomes natural in the sense the new nature to talk to God, to ask God, Lord, make me more like Jesus. Help me to die to these things. Help me to do these things that you've called me to do. Look at verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Yep, he threw that in there. If you love me, keep my commandments commandments. I mentioned earlier the context of obedience, that Jesus was obedient to the will of the Father. Therefore, it will follow that we'll have to be obedient to the Son. It's assumed, it's both assumed and required of disciples. Jesus assumes you will be obedient, and yet it's required that we be obedient. The assumption that if you really come to saving faith, you will, and that you will want to. Notice the wording. He says, if you love me, keep my suggestions, recommendations, requests, really good ideas. No. Commandments. Here's one of my questions I ask from time to time. Probably more than you guys wish, but here's one other one. Is Jesus our Savior? Is he our friend? Is he our Lord? Or our Father? Yes. Yes. Very good. You guys are doing great. (laughs) 
He loves us perfectly. He loves us sacrificially. And he loves us eternally. But he's called us to love him back via surrender and obedience. He's not asking for our money. He's not asking us to prove that we have great abilities. He says, surrender to me and obey me. I've already given you my entire everything through my shed blood. If you love me, obey me. Parents, those of you that are parents, some of you are grandparents now, you can remember back these days. If you've loved your children un conditionally and sacrificially, and every parent has, has made sacrifice their kids will never even know about or understand until they become parents. I didn't say perfectly because none of us have pulled that off. We don't do anything perfectly. But, but you have loved them unconditionally and sacrificially. Is it reasonable to expect obedience? Of course it's reasonable. And if our kids refuse to obey, is that loving or unloving? It's unloving. Jesus gave his life for the disciples. They can't turn around and say, you know, we appreciate you dying for us and all, but um, here's the short list of things we're willing to do. The rest are off limits. If you look at sports, and you guys know I like sports, imagine a player says he loves his coach. Man, I love this coach. He's an awesome coach, but I refuse to do anything he says. Tells me to run lap? Nope. Tells me to run this play? Nope. I do what I want to do. You don't love the coach. By the way, that, he won't be your coach that much longer in that scenario. But love is an action. It's not just words. It's not just words. We love Jesus because he first loved us. We obey his commandments because he's our creator and our savior. And we recognize that he obeyed the father's commands and that we come under the same authority. But not just authority, a family-oriented obedience. Understand that real love is responsive, it's submissive, and it's obedient to proper Authority. We were talking about, I was talking about some, this earlier this week with someone and just saying that, you know, um, when you really love someone, you don't have a big problem giving up some of your desires. There's things that my wife and I, you know, she might prefer this or I might prefer that. I, if it's a really big deal to her, I don't mind saying, I don't need that. It's not that big a deal to me. The relationship, the love is far more important. So we, the Bible talks about submitting one to another. That's why the body of Christ can work in harmony when there's genuine love. We can submit to one another, other people's preferences. God raises someone up. You don't really care because you're like, this isn't my home anyway. I'm not here to get glory. The scriptures also tell us in the latter times, and we're in the latter times for sure. If, if Peter said the latter times started when he stood up at the Pentecost, and that was 2,000 years ago, we are in the late fourth, we're in the two-minute warning, to use a football analogy. But he said in the latter, the Lord says in the latter time, the love of many will grow cold, very cold. Our nation hates submission to God. I love our country, but I, I'm just... You can see it as plain as day. Our nation hates submission to God. Our nation hates submission to the word of God. Our nation hates his commandments. And they hate to even submit to one another. That's why people are so angry at one another. They don't even like to submit. You are not the boss of me. Everybody feels that way about everybody. And selfishness always leads to hate and rage. It leads to Cain killing Abel. Way back then, doesn't change all the way to our time. But the love of God and obedience to God is the opposite. It leads to life. It leads to peace. It leads to his grace. And it leads to his help. Look at verse 16. And I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. And here Jesus makes a promise of divine help that I lived the first 25 years of my life without. And those of you that you remember your before Christ days, you didn't have the helper. You were the helper. 
you would help yourself or, or do the best you could. I would never want to go back to my life before the help that God's given. If you're born again, I would hope that you would agree with that. Jesus says, I'll not only guarantee to help you, but I'll send another helper to be with you. Jesus has been the disciples' helper these last three years, these three years in the ministry. He has been there everything. He's been with them night and day. He has been there to provide for them, to lead them, to guide them, to counsel them. But he promises to send them another helper. Who could, who could, who could possibly replace Jesus? Whoever he sends has to be equal to himself. Amen? Who could replace Jesus? Another person? Not hardly. And Jesus, he said he was leaving, but he was going to send someone who would remain with them, not just for the rest of their lives, but he says, look at verse 16 again. He says that he will abide with you forever. All eternity. If the disciples had believed in Jesus, and they had, if they had chosen him back, and they had, and they were now willing to walk in fellowship and relationship and obedience, and they were, Jesus is promising them, because you've accepted this relationship with me by faith, I am promising to send you a powerful help in your life equal to myself. In fact, the Spirit of God is not only equal to himself, it is himself. He promises to send this helper. The disciples, and by the way, um, he says, if, go back to verse 16, if, um, I promise to give you the helper that he may abide with you forever. Going back to that original if in verse 15, this, it's assumed here, his promise, all of his promises here are connected to their genuine belief, their genuine obedience. Look at verse 17 as we kind of bring this to a close. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be with you. We don't have to wonder who the helper is capital H in most of your Bibles, because Jesus defines the helper by telling the disciples that the helper is none other than the spirit of truth. If you look on the screen, the spirit of truth is the Holy Spirit himself, the third member of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Just some of the names of the Holy Spirit I put up on the screen. There are many more names of the Holy Spirit than the ones that I have on the screen, but these are some of the ones that you may see the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Eternal Spirit, the Spirit of Glory, the Advocate. These are just some of the Holy Spirit's names. He's not a less than God the Father and God the Son. They are co-equal, separate persons of the Godhead, and yet one, we've talked about this many times before, can we fully define the Trinity? Absolutely not. It is beyond our comprehension. Can we appreciate it? Absolutely, we can appreciate it. Can we receive it? Of course, we can receive it. Pastor Chuck Smith said this about the Holy Spirit. He goes, the Holy Spirit, the blessed third person of the Trinity, is the great gift God has given to you and me, not just the apostles there. Uh, he has come to be our comforter, our parakletos, which is a Greek word meaning the advocate, comforter, and helper. It means simultaneously all three of those things. Jesus are at the Spirit. Jesus gives us the Spirit to be our advocate, our comforter, and our helper all at the same time. You know, you can go into work, not tomorrow, uh, hopefully you're uh, off tomorrow, but anyway, uh, unless you have a, a job that you have to work and you're in hospital health care or something like that, but whatever day you go back to work, whether it's Monday or Tuesday, you can go to work knowing that you have the advocate, the comforter, and the helper residing in you. Isn't that great to know? Speaking of the Trinity, I count 13 times in verses 12 through 18, 13 times in verses 12 through 18, 
that Jesus speaks of himself in first person. One additional time where he says the son speaking in second person. Three times he mentions the father by name. Seven times he mentions the Holy Spirit. Once as helper, once as spirit of truth, and five other times as he or him speaking of the Holy Spirit. Uh, earlier this week, uh, myself and Pastor Trevor, uh, we were discussing these passages with uh, Bradley and Javon who are doing this summer internship, uh, desiring to be in ministry. So I wanted to talk through these passages the way I look through them, sort them, start to study them, start to kind of break them down. And just we were just talking about them, and we were discussing these verses and just how vividly you can see the Trinity and just these verses, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, just bursting from these verses, all within the promises of Jesus. And it is so comforting to know that the triune God, Jesus, the Son, and the Spirit, surround the family of God by His presence. You may feel like you're surrounded by a world that is going to hell in a handbasket, but in fact, you're surrounded by God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Amen? That's good to know. It's comforting to know. And only Jesus is the one that introduces us to all the fullness of the Godhead, to know the Father, to know the Son, to know the Spirit, to know them in the persons, but also in the oneness. He is the way to the Father. He is the truth of salvation. He is life now and for all eternity through the Holy Spirit. He says here in verse 17 as well, he said, whom the world... Uh, the world cannot see or know him. The world cannot receive the helper. The world cannot receive the Holy Spirit because they have yet to believe in the Son. Until you believe in the Son, there is no given spirit to a person who refuses to believe in the Son. Not only that, they cannot see because or sense the Spirit, or the work of the Spirit, or see the hand of God in things, because anyone without Christ is still in what? Total darkness. They think, the world thinks, we're disconnected from reality because we talk to our imaginary God. Literally, I see people say this on Twitter, I see them say it on Instagram, all this stuff. They think we're disconnected from reality. The reality is, we're connected to reality, they're disconnected from reality. Because the reality is life is but a vapor and they will meet the God they don't think they can see or understand face to face. But Jesus says if you come now, you would be able to receive the Spirit. They cannot pray or seek the help of the Spirit until there's repentance. There has to be repentance first. But we, and this is totally foreign to the disciples at the time, we have the Spirit. Jesus said he not only be with, will be with you, but in you. In the Old Testament, they saw that the Spirit would come upon people, come upon Samson, right? The Spirit comes upon Samson. He can rip lions. He can, rip, he can carry half the gate or half the walls of the city. The Spirit would come upon, but God is saying, Jesus is saying, no, no, I'm doing something totally new. I'm going to have the Spirit live in you. This would have been foreign to the disciples. It tells us in 2 Corinthians 1.22, who also has sealed us and given us the Holy Spirit, who has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our what? In our hearts as a guarantee. The Holy Spirit now lives inside of me. The power of the triune God lives inside of those who have received the Son as Lord and Savior. What an amazing thing. We can live with confidence and courage by the Spirit. There is a great confidence. Once you know that the Lord lives in you, you have a great confidence that your salvation is secure. And once you start walking in the Holy Spirit, you have a courage that's impossible unless you walk in the Spirit. Last verse, verse 18, and we'll bring it to a close. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. It's true that Jesus is leaving soon. He's already told them that. That's why they're troubled in the first place. He is going to be leaving. But he's not like a derelict father in the modern age. He will not abandon his own, will he? He says, I'll be leaving, but my spirit will be coming immediately to you. That third person of the Trinity, that co-equal 
He will live inside of you. So yes, I will be leaving. But it doesn't just stop with that. Not only will I immediately send you the Spirit, the Helper, so you're not an orphan, that I am living inside of you, not walking around the shores of Galilee anymore, <laughs> living inside of you. But he had already said, I'm going to come back and receive you. And the Spirit will stay in us for all eternity. So we now have the Spirit to walk in and through this world with the Lord until we walk up into heaven, into the clouds, to meet him in the clouds, to be with him forever. I told the first service, and how many times I will be walking or praying, I will look up into the clouds, I'm like, Lord, I'll be meeting you there soon. But I already have in my heart right now, how about you? That I already have the Spirit of God to walk with, but it's that future home, I'm no longer an orphan, We're a, you've been saved, you've already been adopted into the family of God. The only thing we're waiting now on is our permanent residence. Mm -hmm. We have the Spirit living in us now, and we're just waiting on that. And all of this, all of this is done. When our course is done, all of this is done in His name, by His Spirit, with His help, if we belong to Him. Let's close in prayer. Father, we come before You once again, and Jesus, we are so grateful that You not only promised the Spirit, but you immediately gave the Spirit. And not only to us individually, but Lord, the church has been birthed in the Spirit. And we now have the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us and to teach us and to protect us from error and to protect us from deception and to protect us from ourselves and even wanting to go back to Egypt, if it, as it were, uh, that sometimes, Lord, our eyes look longingly at the things and you tell us to snap out of it and start talking to you and asking you and Lord, just walking in communion with you. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for the spirit of truth and a world of deception. Lord, we know the truth. You are the truth. You are the way and the life. And now living inside of us, not just coming upon us, but truly, Lord, part of this new nature that you've given us by your grace. And Lord, as we come to a close here, uh, Lord, we just... We want to now move into this time of taking the Lord's Supper, this uh, other command you've given us. It is, not a, uh, it is not a burdensome thing to keep your commands, Lord. We love to keep your commands because that is how we grow in our love relationship with you. So, Lord, we're thankful for this time as we enter into communion. Um, I just want to ask everyone here, to, if you don't have the elements, raise your hand and we can make sure you get them. I know some... Most of you probably have them, but actually there's quite a few that don't. So please get everyone the elements that they don't have. The communion elements, we'll be passing them out. At the end of the service, if you need prayer for anything or you don't know Jesus is your Lord and Savior and you want to talk to us personally about it, we'll have some folks in the corner over here. Uh, just as I mentioned, the upper room discourse was for believers. The taking of the Lord's Supper is really for believers as well. It's something that God, uh, we know that in this same upper room setting is where Jesus took the Passover meal and he explained how that Passover meal was his body and his blood given for those that would believe on him and, and uh, believe on him for salvation through faith in Christ. And so this, just as the upper room discourse was for believers, Judas had to leave the room and, and then uh, Jesus is uh, continuing on to teach. Uh, these things that we take, I mean, there's people that can kind of look at it, oh, it's just some kind of like, um, you know, Christian thing y'all do. You take, no, no, no. It's a very sacred thing. And something that we're called to do in remembrance. This is one of the commands. We're, this is a great way for all of us to realign our obedience right here at the middle of the year, the 3rd of July, to say, Lord, even as we take these elements, it's also me re-surrendering. The Bible talks about uh, um, Romans chapter 12, to present ourselves as living sacrifices, re-surrendering our obedience to Christ. Say, Lord, we're taking these elements not as a ritual, but as a remembrance and a rededication of ourselves to, Lord, we love you, and because we love you, 
It's because you first loved us, and we want to love you back through obedience and surrender. So just take the next few moments or minutes. Uh, the worship team will be leading us in some music here to just talk to the Lord and just search your heart and say, Lord, I need to release this. I need to confess this. I need to throw this back at your feet. And he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then we'll take these elements together. So let's just uh, pray and worship for just a moment. How deep the fall. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all Jesus knows that by nature, we, our flesh is very forgetful. He knows that by later this afternoon or by tomorrow, you may consider a cheeseburger greater than the gospel for a momentary lapse of sanity in your mind. But it's not, right? I mean, because we, we, we get... we. We can leave the presence of God and be back in the temporal in a matter of seconds. Microseconds, in fact. We can be distracted by something in a New York minute. But that's why he said, as the church, until he returns, keep taking the Lord's Supper. Keep, keep, keep going back to that night. Keep going back to that time. Keep going back. Keep going back. Keep going back. And we don't backslide ever. We're not called to. We do, but if we don't, we're not called to do that. But we are called to look back at the cross on a regular basis 
of what Jesus has done for us. And, and the taking of it, as I mentioned, this is part of our obedience, that, that we do these things in remembrance of him, that we're going to remember this and we're going to take it as often, uh, at least enough, that it stays fresh in our minds. And so we, we try and do it the first Sunday of each month and remember what the Lord has done for us. But let me pray and then we'll take these elements together. Jesus, we do want to remember... <laughs> We know that even when we get to heaven, your hands and feet will still be nail-scarred. For all eternity, that will be a testament for us to remember. Even in heaven where we won't even have sin anymore, you don't want us to forget the cross. You don't want us to forget your sacrifice. There'll be the marriage supper of the Lamb, which will be the, the fulfillment of this meal in your presence. You said you wouldn't even touch the fruit of the vine until that time, but Lord, there'll be that perpetual remembrance through the scars, through the feast, that we will always treasure that you saved us by grace. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Lord, thank you for so great a salvation. We couldn't earn it. We couldn't keep it. But Lord, you keep us, and Lord, we just want to resurrender our obedience to you, our commitment to you, our lives to you. We take these elements, Lord, not in some ritual, but, Lord, truly in a relationship and a remembrance of all that you've done for us. We ask, Lord, that you would wash us and cleanse us. And we just want to say thank you. Thank you for dying for us. No one would ever do these things for us. And even if they could, they couldn't save us, but you did. And now you've given us your spirit. And we just say thank you, thank you, thank you. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take of the bread. Likewise also he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you, let's take of the cup. Once you stand, and we'll just close and brief worship, and you'll be dismissed.
get to the same, it's in the same upper room discourse where Jesus will say, apart from me you can do nothing. All of this is the same discourse. We've got a few chapters before we get to there. But that Christ in us is the helper. The Holy Spirit. Only given to those that have put their faith and trust in Him. And if there's anyone here today and you haven't done that and you want to, you can come see us after the service. We would love to spend the time with you to answer any questions D.L. Moody used to say more people got saved in the inquiry room than, than even uh, the altar call. So uh, both are important, but uh, we'll have that opportunity if you need prayer for anything. Uh, if you need any information, we have the informo information booth back open. It's the little thing on wheels out there. You can't miss it out there to the left. If you're visiting and you have questions, we'd love to answer those too, get to know you. Uh, but thank you for uh, being here today and just an opportunity for us to reflect on all that Jesus has done for us. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace bestowed upon us. Uh, Lord, salvation and now the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that it, as we go throughout this week, we'd walk in relationship with you, uh, talking to you, asking you those things which are the nature and character of Jesus. Lord, refine our requests. And Lord, uh, that you would conform us to your image uh, your patience, your boldness, your perseverance, Lord, your compassion, all of those things would take place in us as you uh, just build in us the work of Christ. And Lord, we pray that you would uh, bring a lost and dying world to saving faith. Use us this week as your lights and your witnesses. We pray for our nation. We'll be celebrating today and tomorrow. We're thankful for the freedoms, but we pray that these freedoms would be used to serve you not used to rebel against you. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Happy fourth and have a great week.